volume? So we're doing the fireside chat thing <laughs> without a fire or wine, which we thought would have been much nicer. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, the HSI conferences always, exci always excite me because it's such a passion of mine. And uh, this is a lovely five-year reunion. Uh, hard to believe it's been five years. We're missing about six deputy ministers, 10 to 12 municipal staff representatives, and a whole lot of provincial staff that used to sit in, this in the room, not quite this large. We were pretty packed in there. Um, week after week and month after month to come up with the final agreement. But it was an exciting agreement. And we, I think we were all fairly realistic that the change would move slowly because we know politics and policy aren't things that happen quickly. But some of the change in, in housing have been very exciting and definitely supportive of PMFSDR. And I'm glad that was explained to folks because I know there's new people in the room um, who weren't around in 2008 Sometimes. who maybe don't get that acronym, and we are quite a group of acronyms. So, as I said, great reunion, and it'll be interesting. I'm quite anxious to see what my panelists have to say. So with us this morning is Brian Rosborough. Brian was with AMO during PMFSDR and is now the Senior Executive Officer of the Branford Campus of Wilfrid Laurier University. Cleona next to him is Cleona McMillan. Cleona was uh, the Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Community and Social Services during PMFSDR. <laughs> and <laughs> Assistant Deputy <laughs> Minister, sorry. <laughs> Didn't, I gave you a, a raise there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is now retired but still working. And Heather McVicker, there's a bit of a theme here, was the former general manager of the City of Toronto's Employment and Social Services Division, now retired, but still working. Um, so Brian, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Patty. We've got some slides here. I think I've, I've got a clicker with a very big green button that I, I think I could uh, even find without my glasses on. Um, delighted to be here. Uh, first, I want to say thank you, and I'll, I'll say it on, on behalf of uh, the three of us. It's it's a delight to be back uh, working with OMSA. Uh, I think, as Patty mentioned, uh, the three of us have now moved on to other, other aspects of our lives, other careers, and uh, the opportunity to, to spend some time together with uh, Heather and Cleana and to think about what was accomplished during the uh, Provincial Municipal Review was, uh, was something I think that we were all delighted to, uh, to participate in. Um, I want to pick up, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the context in which the review happened, how we accomplished, you know, getting, uh, getting a review underway and some of the, the larger sort of macro results. Kleena is going to talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the actual service delivery and accountability table, which was a fundamentally important part of, um, of, of the work that we did, and Heather's going to talk about implementation. Some of the earlier speakers this morning talked about partnership. Uh, and I think uh, I would like to echo that. Uh, the, the Provincial Municipal Fiscal Service Delivery Review, I'll try not to say it every time, um, was a really interesting and productive opportunity for partnership in the municipal sector. So we had AMO, uh, City of Toronto, Government of Ontario working together uh, to, to bring about some very significant changes. And OMSA played a very significant role in that as well, as you'll hear. There were many uh, OMSA leaders, board members, and uh, senior officials from the sector who participated uh, in, in a very important way in that process. So um, building on, on Pat's uh, history of, of uh, social services, a couple, uh, I think there are a couple of things that are important to remember. There's been a long history of cost sharing and human services programming here in Ontario. Uh, the mid-90s brought about some other very important changes in social services with the introduction of Ontario Works and the introduction of uh, broader employment services related to social assistance. Big step forward for the sector, uh, important uh, partnership between municipalities and the province, uh, major role for OMSA as well. Uh, local services realignment, as Pat mentioned, also affected the transfer of sole support parents from the former uh, provincial caseload and the former FBA program uh, into Ontario Works and uh, a, a new role in, in funding ODSP, as Pat mentioned. Um, the Provincial Municipal Service Delivery Review created the new framework 
the one in which we now operate, and, and we'll talk about that at length. But just quickly how we got there. Um, Pat talked about local services realignment and the, uh, the, the fiscal framework that we were working under in the mid-90s. It uh, wasn't really working for uh, municipalities. When the election occurred in 2003, I think all partner sectors and stakeholders uh, thought it's time for a new conversation with the province, whether it was in education, in healthcare, and uh, I think we all sort of lined up to, to have that opportunity to take a look and, and make new arrangements. Um, around that time, the province had undertaken a campaign with the federal government about its fiscal municipal relationship and had what was called the $23 billion uh, gap campaign in which they outlined the amount of money that was going from Ontario into federal coffers, the net effect of what wasn't coming back. And so when the province asked AMO as one of its partner stakeholders to uh, support that campaign, and, and it talked to all of the key uh, partners in the province about doing that, we said we'd be delighted to support the campaign and we knew what it felt like because there was a, about a three, $3 billion gap uh, in terms of what uh, municipalities were contributing towards what might conventional, conventionally be considered provincially, provincial responsibilities in terms of funding. And that related to uh, social assistance. I'm, I'm looking at my slides that I have not <laughs> passed along for you. Okay, all right, there we go. How's that? It's a new experience, this sitting on the low chairs thing. I'm not even sure if you can see in the back, but uh, in any event, we, uh, we, um, we outlined uh, an array of important human services that municipalities were involved in. Uh, you know, it's not the whole story about the provincial municipal fiscal relationship, but in the area of key human services, which were conventionally funded by provinces and other, uh, other places, uh, um, we, we, we identified about a net 3.2, 3.25 billion dollar gap. Um, in the past, that fiscal issue had been talked about as inappropriate for income redistribution programs to be funded on the property tax base. It's a complicated idea. It, it doesn't, it makes sense to those of us who understand it. Uh, it's not something that easily municipal politicians can talk to their taxpayers about. Using the language of the three billion dollar gap made it simpler, more compelling, easier to explain, and I think in time, it became part of the discourse that uh, uh, the province heard loud and clear and, and uh, came to the table to talk about. Um, the premise was that the old uh, system of, of financial arrangements wasn't good policy, it wasn't good fiscal policy, and it was time to, uh, to create some new ones, and I'm going to advance the slide this time. Um, so we, uh, in, uh, in 2006, began a formal process to take a look at the fiscal arrangements, but beyond that, uh, a need to look at a, a range of other aspects of the, the provincial municipal uh, relationship, uh, including uh, the extent to which uh, infrastructure investment was being affected in municipalities, what's the fiscal health of municipalities, uh, and, and you can see there that the tables that were set up covered all of those areas. Um, it, it was a situation where AMO and the City of Toronto together were sitting down with the province, in particular with the Minister, Minister, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing and the Ministry of Finance to take a look at what made sense in terms of a, a fiscal and service delivery arrangement that would work in the 21st century. And there were some key elements that, uh, that drove the uh, process that we agreed upon it would have to be, reflect a consensus, it would be negotiated, it would have to be good public policy, it would have to be affordable for both orders of government, for municipalities and the province. Uh, and and you, as you know, the, the, the general impact of the upload that was negotiated is about $1.5 billion a year when fully implemented, and we're in the process of doing that now. I think one of the um, important points about that is that when that deal was signed in, in 2008, it really did reflect an acknowledgement by both the province and municipalities that these were appropriate, uh, responsible, this was an appropriate alignment of responsibilities. So I think uh, it really is intended to, to work into the future and um, you'll hear a bit, a bit more of that in a moment. Some of the, all right, that's the slide. Some of the uh, 
key challenges that we face, because this is a pretty high stakes kind of discussion we're entering into, uh, was who should be at the table. Uh, obviously, not all 400 plus municipalities can participate directly in this kind of uh, uh, discussion. So we had uh, key political officials from AMO and the City of Toronto, and a very broad array of senior staff, primarily from municipalities and also from municipal associations such as OMSA, who, who participated in the discussions. There was, a, I think, a long-standing concern expressed by, in particular, uh, members of OMSA. Uh, would AMO and, and Toronto uh, politicians uh, be sensitive enough to the real value of the delivery of human services in the community to, to safeguard uh, what, what is really a fundamental aspect of, uh, of economic and community development in Ontario. And I think it's, I can certainly safely say the time that I was at AMO and, and participated in these discussions, no one had ever lost sight of the fact that municipalities do uh, a, a fantastic job of, of delivering human services in the community that uh, really there's no one better to do that. And I think that was always a fundamental part of the discussions. And I think finally, and I'll, with that I'll pass it over to Kleena, is uh, it was important for us to advance the discussion beyond simply the fiscal arrangements and to have a conversation that talked about how can we do a better job in partnership, for example, of delivering human services uh, in the community. And with that I'll pass it over to Kleena to talk about the, the table that dealt with that issue specifically. <coughs> And Kleena may have to prompt me to change the slide <laughs> from time to time. Thank you, Brian. Um, can everyone hear me? So I'm not sure whether this is turned on. It yes. is now. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about the service delivery and accountability table. One is a review working tables. And the table's mandate, as outlined in the slide, is basically to look at service delivery arrangements and accountability for the cost-shared human service programs, the ones listed there. Not funding, not policy, but rather opportunities for more effective and accountable service delivery. So I'm going to talk first of all give you a bit of an overview on the table process. Then I'll talk about how we approach the work. And I'll finish off with what was agreed to politically and some comments about what worked well for the table and what we could anticipate would be a challenge going forward. So the process, 24 members <coughs> appointed by AMO, the province, and the city of Toronto. Senior staff, assistant deputy ministers from the province, social service commissioners, and CAOs from CMSMs and DSAMs. Supported by a small secretariat that worked full time and was funded by the province. And also extensive staff support from AMO, from Toronto, and from the provincial ministries and Rob. We met every two weeks for <laughs> almost a year. And in between, the provincial and municipal members would meet independently to coordinate their input and support for the table. And we also put together ad hoc working groups to deal with specific issues, which also involve people from beyond the table. So for example, on employment, we had folks from the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities, Citizenship, NTCU, MCSS. The table worked collaboratively, decisions were made by consensus, and we shared the work. So in terms of the work itself, first of all, the table agreed on a very clear shared objective to guide the work human services that were responsive to people's needs and focused in outcomes. So with that guiding um, objective, we looked at each program. We did a program by program review of services. We looked at service delivery and accountability issues, for example, overlaps and gaps in services concerns that access to services for clients was often really confusing and time-consuming and 
difficult. We looked at the uh, other issues that have been raised was the lack of flexibility to better integrate services and also concerns related to what we've seen as overly complicated administrative funding and reporting requirements. We also took a look at what other jurisdictions had done in terms of accountability frameworks focused on outcomes. The work that ONSA had done in human services integration was a really important resource at the time. The LSR work on accountability and particularly important to the table is the experience of municipalities in Ontario with service innovation. So we developed, in terms of accountability, we looked at an accountability framework that was outcomes focused and linked to a community human service plan. Key features of that would include outcomes based provincial policy frameworks, local outcome targets, funding that would be linked to outcomes, multi-year service contracting, and the need to build local planning capacity. In terms of service delivery, we looked at a number of different scenarios and looked at core outcomes by policy area, looked at opportunities to better integrate programs, looked at supports for stronger accountability, and also looked at supports for integrated local planning. So we explored seven different scenarios with a focus on the human services that were delivered by municipalities. So we didn't look at ODSP or the Ontario Drug Benefit Program, which were delivered by the province, but our focus was on the municipally delivered services. So in terms of scenarios, we looked at consolidating the housing and homelessness programs at the municipal level. We looked at the streamlining and modernizing of income and employment system with the potential for reallocating resources to better client service. We looked at better integration of employment services with supports for integrated local planning, better integration of childcare and children's services, on land ambulance services, we looked at continuing the existing delivery arrangement because the system was still evolving, but with the potential for integrating dispatch. And then on public health, enhancing public health board governance to better support local planning. And municipal homes for the aged continue again with their, the direction that was underway at that time for improving services. So having reviewed the scenarios, we also looked forward to who should be responsible for what. And in this, we basically had, we had consensus where, as you'll see from the slides, where municipalities were identified as having shared accountability the role was that of service system manager. So three different scenario areas, shared accountability, municipal role, service system manager. So the outcomes agreed to politically. The next two slides. Basically the outcomes that were agreed to politically were very consistent with the <coughs> scenarios that were developed at the table. Working towards consolidating the many housing and homelessness programs at that time we were looking at, I think it was about 25 or so, there were quite a number. Looking at developing jointly an accountability framework focused on outcomes or results. Working together to simplify and modernize delivery of income assistance and employment. Better integrate being Ontario Works, ODSP and Employment Ontario Employment Services and to improve outcomes for clients. Next one. And three more, maintaining the current integration of public health programs, maintaining current service delivery arrangements related to land ambulance, 
better integration of child care and children's services. And recognizing at that time the province had an early learning advisor who was looking at early learning programming, looking at recommending, passing on to that advisor the discussions at the table. So basically, that was the direction in terms of what worked well for the table. What really worked well, I'd say, is looking back, is that we had the commitment and political engagement of the three parties involved. We had really good staff support and resourcing, not only for the table meetings, but also in between, which meant that people came to the meetings really well prepared, and there weren't a lot of surprises, so that the work was progressive. And thirdly, the experience and expertise of the people at the table, and what was really a shared philosophy that what really counted was responsive services that were focused in outcomes. At the time, looking at what had been agreed to going forward, one could anticipate that a really a key challenge would be maintaining the momentum. You could see that as one's looking at developing outcomes-based policy frameworks, defining outcomes, looking at working to better integrate services, that kind of work takes a huge amount of time. It takes a lot of persistence and patience. Much of the work is, doesn't have immediate deliverables, and a lot of the work, quite a bit of the work is invisible especially when it comes to changing administrative processes, which is really important if one's looking at putting programs together and consolidating and streamlining. So one could anticipate if to keep that momentum going forward, there would need to be a lot of support, a lot of encouragement from all the partners involved. And so now I'm gonna pass it on to Heather to talk about what happened. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, am I, is my mic on now? Yeah. Okay. Just before I go on to talk about the process that ensued from that table, I just want to say a word because uh, a lot of you may not be aware of the relationship of the city as a separate entity um, from AMO and the province. Uh, sometime in the mid-2000s, a political decision was made that the city would operate separately as an entity from AMO. So, but not with, in terms of the relationship and the discussions with the province. Notwithstanding that, at the staff level, we continued to participate in the existing tables, uh, particularly the human services tables, uh, as a kind of a quasi ex officio so that we ensured that we maintained a good relationship and we ensured that our thinking uh, relative to the other municipalities was also aligned. Against that backdrop then, we went into this process and I think that really stood us in good stead. Uh, we were able to initiate a number of um, uh, secondary behind the scenes processes that really helped ensure that what we brought to the table was very much in line and aligned together. Uh, the other thing I would comment on is I think the success of that table was due to the fact, and Cleona's mentioned quite a bit, I think it was due to the fact that there were uh, all, uh, the majority of the members of that table, both provincially and municipally, were highly skilled senior staff with a tremendous commitment and a tremendous acumen for seeing the process through. But I do want to acknowledge and recognize Brian as part of AMO and Cleona as the chair of this and my former uh, boss, uh, the city deputy city manager, Sue Court, who co-chaired uh, as really taking the leadership and uh, with that experience, and uh, tremendous skill, really were able to see the process through. So what came out of uh, that process, along with the outcomes that Cleona's mentioned, is really um, a, a vision and a concept 
for an integrated uh, service delivery model that could form the basis of a community service plan. And what you see before you is a picture that was adopted by the service delivery table. I, I have to say um, everyone was of, of, of one mind in terms of how they saw this human services delivery system going forward. It really was meant to depict a vision for the development of that community service plan that had the principles starting with customer client centered, accessible, integrated, flexible, outcome focused, clear roles and responsibilities, streamlined, reduced complexity, continuous improvement, affordable and cost effective. Um, much of what was tied to how we saw outcomes going forward. So the how to then, as Cleona touched on, is a totally different matter. Bringing about such a vision and such a concept uh, among the variety of programs and the way that the programs operate very discreetly uh, was no mean, is no mean feat. We were very cognizant of the need to establish once the, the PMFSDR process was concluded, another official process that would drive forward the work that had been done and the agreed upon recommendations. I, I would say before getting into that, that this, I believe, I believe that this model of integrated human services stands the test of time, even when you uh, compare it against the Drummond Report and the Social Assistance Reform Report, I think you can see recommendations here uh, in those reports. So it's a, it's a real foundation piece that's already been agreed to by both the province and the municipalities. Very quickly, because I know time is running short, um, we established the Human Resources uh, HISIC group and, uh, and much the same kind of config configuration as PMFSDR used, three co-chairs, uh, and it was a combination of uh, various ministries, uh, provincial ministries, cutting across largely all of the human services sector and the municipalities. There were three subgroups established, um, the cost of admin, uh, because that was very much top of mind in terms of the fact that the cost sharing on the delivery of the services had gotten way out of whack. Um, the, um, the, housing and, uh, the housing and homelessness consolidated working group, uh, Janet Hope spoke to that this morning, uh, and uh, the employment working group. The results coming out of those three groups uh, were then forwarded to the main body of the table, and I'll just go through briefly what were the outcomes of those. The cost of admin group, uh, again, met very frequently over a prolonged period of time. We did uh, really intensive work in terms of looking at different models of service delivery uh, and different opportunities for looking at how we could how we could improve and really transform uh, the way the delivery system was funded. The other major thing we did in that group was we really looked intensively at the dynamics of what transpired on the caseload and what were the variables around that that really factored into the work involved and the need for the work uh, in, in terms of providing the management of that caseload. Uh, we just, we ended up with a discussion paper that was with a number of um, recommended approaches that was then approved by the HISIC table. Out of that, I, I, one more point I would make about that is that the province in the middle of that process was under tremendous pressure emanating from their own fiscal restraints uh, to redress the cost of um, admin funding formula and with no new money. And that created considerable tension at that table because in terms of going forward with a new model, without any additional funding, it meant there would be winners and losers. 
I'm, I'm happy to say that while that discussion paper was approved by the HISIC table, subsequent to that, the province did come forward to redress the cost of admin, and I would, I would commend the provincial staff and the province for adding dollars to that, that overall envelope of money that then meant that no municipality uh, suffered as a result of the introduction of the new formula. There was also a new formula for the delivery of services introduced that came out of the work of that table. And I, I have to say, uh, for the first time, for the very first time in this province, there was a rational uh, caseload formula that could then be presented along with caseload forecasts to the Ministry of Finance, and that's a first. So the, up, the outcome of that table at the end of the day was very, very positive. The housing and homelessness, um, uh, much of the deliberations from that table went into the long-term um, housing affordability strategy of the province that was tabled separately, but a lot of the, the, the work of that group came from that. Uh, Janet talked about the CHIPI, um, uh, uh, the CHIPI program that was the consolidation of the five uh, homelessness programs, which is one of the principal products of that group. Uh, the thing that I would say about that that was so significant, notwithstanding the wrinkle, so to speak, or more than a wrinkle, uh, with the inclusion of CSUB after mm -hmm. the fact with its implementation, um, was the fact that for the first time, uh, the design of that program focused on homeless prevention as opposed to homeless support. So looking at housing stability and shifting the resources that way. And that again, I don't, in, in the aftermath of all that ensued in terms of implementation, we should not lose sight of moving the yardstick forward so well on that, that area. The third working group, the employment working group, was probably, I would say it was very complex in its discussion, uh, which is very reflective of, of the environment overall with employment programs. Um, as you all know, because of the way in which the employment programs have grown, you have virtually every combination and permutation of governance, planning, management, and delivery of employment programs in every order of government and many community organizations involved. So trying to get a handle on that and pull that together in a way, and we were very cognizant of starting from what existed and moving forward, not trying to just you know, start with a, a blank sheet. How to move that discussion forward in a productive way, in a positive way, was, it was a real mind bender, quite frankly. Uh, we set about trying to draw a picture and a map of all of the employment programs and all of those elements of the management and delivery and the governance, governance models. Uh, and that in itself was, um, you had to be there to really try and figure out how that worked. We did end up with a picture, it's very, very difficult to delineate um, because it's not a linear process and so you had to be arbitrary to some extent. In terms of moving forward, we were also very cognizant that redesign and transformation of the employment system and the integration with the other human services um, was certainly not going to be a one-day wonder. And how could we start with uh, a very traumatic point in time? So we, we talked about some key approaches, which were the, was the need to tie economic employment services to economic development, which had not really been recognized that way before. And that given the regional differences, uh, that the services and the planning should be local planning and delivery. Uh, we also recognized and talked about the integral need for other community supports to ensure positive and, um, and strong outcomes of employment programs and that we needed to balance 
the employer with the employment services, that the employer was as much a client and a customer as the people and the, uh, the residents were serving. We came up with a framework that anchored, uh, anchored the work with the employment resource centers throughout the province. Uh, the premise being that if we could start with what was visible and come up with some common frameworks, some common standards, uh, some common core set of services, regardless of who ran or was accountable for the resource center, that that would be a very positive, visible step forward to begin to harmonize and consolidate employment services and provide that presence in the community to the employers as well. We tabled a paper with the Hissick Group uh, that contained all of those elements. Um, that paper has not, in terms of this context, been actioned that I'm aware of. There may be elements of that now taking place with uh, what's gone forward. Um, but it certainly is there, and it, it outlines um, a way forward and a vision. Uh, what's outstanding is the community services uh, planning uh, as well, and the, the work around the accountability framework, um, which was hard to, uh, to do as a parallel process to all of this because so much was changing at the same time. Uh, now, I know that there has been another process. Just as I was leaving, uh, retiring, I, uh, just after I left, there was another table established, which pretty much mirrors the previous one. And certainly, I'm very hopeful that all that work is, is going forward. And I look forward to the next panel <laughs> and hearing what the progress has been to date. Thank you. Great. I'd like to thank all the members of the panel for bringing back the energy and the passion <laughs> of that time. It was, um, you know, as a member of that service accountability table, it was really exciting. And it's hard to believe it's five years and there has been some progress, but I think we need to find ways to bring back that energy and passion. And as Cleona said, keep the momentum going. Um, certainly, personally, I want to thank people like David Carter, Whitney, Aaron, Hannah, and Janet Hope, who were all involved at that process, who continue to carry the torch. And, and we all need to find a way to continue to carry that torch because it was really positive work. We've seen some change. We need more of it. And the next panel that David Landers is going to uh, moderate is going to talk about where we're at now. So thank you again. <laughs>